Mormonism with the Murph, where Larry Singh explores church history and the church's truth claims. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. So in the last episode, we had a look at some of the criticisms leveled against the authenticity of the priesthood restoration. We had specifically looked at why was there no date given for the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood, why was Doctrine and Covenants 27 changed to add in the priesthood restoration from John the Baptist and Peter, James and John, why did Joseph and Oliver not talk explicitly about their ordinations to the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood until 1834-1835? Does this show that it was just a later fabrication or invention that they're retrofitting back to 1829? We had some look at some specific criticisms from people like Grant Palmer or Dan Vogel as a way to sort of bolster Joseph's authority as prophet being challenged and also so Oliver could rise to like second in command in the church as assistant president. And we had a look at sort of Oliver's testimony. So we try to look at what the critics said and what the apologists and faithful position would be as well. And this is going to be sort of continuing on from this, but it's going to be looking more at development in priesthood, priesthood offices, priesthood organization. And quite a big focus of this video is going to be understanding the restoration, particularly of the Melchizedek priesthood as a process versus an event, sort of challenging some of our assumptions or views when it comes to the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood narrative. So before I get into the controversies, I actually think uh, the church history department has done a very good video. You can watch this on the church, uh, church's own website, uh, but I'm gonna play the video because I think they talk quite, quite simply a good overview about developments in priesthood organization and offices. So unless we study history, I think it's really easy for us to assume that the church has basically run the same way from the beginning. Um, but we know that that's not exactly how it's gone. Uh, how has this been the case with the development of the priesthood? What are some of the things that Joseph Smith might have seen differently than we understand them today? Joseph learned line upon line, precept upon precept, just like we all do. For example, some of the things that he learned about priesthood and some of the authority that was restored with the priesthood came because Joseph asked questions, because he wondered about things. So, for example, when he and Oliver Cowdery are translating the Book of Mormon, they come upon passages that talk about baptism and the authority to baptize. And this leads them to wonder, does the authority to baptize exist on the earth? And if it does, who has it? If it doesn't, how do we get that authority? And it was based on that question that John the Baptist appeared to Joseph and Oliver on May 15, 1829, to restore the Aaronic priesthood, this authority to baptize. And the same thing happens with the Melchizedek priesthood, that it's really questions about the authority to confer the Holy Ghost upon individuals that leads to the restoration of that authority. So by the time the church was founded, the authority was present because Joseph Smith had asked these questions. Uh, how did his understanding of that authority develop? For one thing, he didn't call it Aaronic priesthood and Melchizedek priesthood at the time that these authorities were restored. That comes in about 1835 when you really see those titles uh, affixed to those different authorities. Okay, so when the church was founded in 1830, uh, the priesthood authority was there, although we didn't necessarily call them by those exact names. Um, what about the development of priesthood offices and the administration of the church? Today, we're governed by a first presidency, Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and the Seventy. Uh, people might be surprised to know that when the church was first organized in April of 1830, none of those things existed. Uh, the administration of the church was from Joseph Smith, first elder, Oliver Cowdery, second elder. The first presidency comes about after Joseph is ordained president of the high priesthood in 1832, and he then subsequently ordains two counselors to himself. And it's really not until 1835 that this body is referred to as the first presidency. Is there any comparison to the way that the Quorum of the Twelve developed? At the time that the apostles were organized in 1835, they had different responsibilities. They had a very heavy proselyting responsibility that they were supposed to go out and serve as special witnesses of Christ. And so they served several missions to the Eastern United States, to England, and to other places. And it's really not until the 1840s that you see their administrative role begin to develop more into what we would uh, see it today. What about some of the other priesthood offices? Uh, how have those developed uh, to look as they do to church members today? Well, if you take, for example, the offices that we have in the Aaronic Priesthood, priests, teachers, and deacons, they had different functions in the 1830s than they have today. Today, we think of those as being preparatory offices for youth uh, to help them prepare to receive the Melchizedek Priesthood. And oftentimes, we see the function of those offices as being directly re related to the sacrament. So the deacons uh, pass the sacrament, the teachers prepare the sacrament, the priests bless the sacrament. But back in the 1830s, these offices didn't have those same functions. For the priests, their primary responsibility was to help elders preach the gospel. 
And so they were sent out to make appointments for elders. They were called to be companions with elders to go out and preach the gospel to individuals. Now, you have to understand, too, that early on in the church, there are so many people that are going out to preach the gospel that uh, you needed people there in different branches and locations to actually be able to help regulate the church. And so teachers had the responsibility to watch over the church. Now, today we know that as home teaching, and the teachers still have that responsibility. But back in the 1830s, it really was more of the teacher's responsibility to do that. And they were to be assisted by the deacons in carrying out that responsibility. Uh, how has learning about the development of the priesthood in the church impacted the way you understand the church? Well, for me, it's been a great testimony of how the Lord works with a prophet. Joseph learned as he went along. He learned as he had questions. He learned line upon line. And that's the same way that the Lord operates with average church members, too. Uh, when we need revelation about something, if we pray about it, if we ask the Lord about it, he'll reveal those things to us. But he doesn't necessarily show us everything at once. So it was 1835 is when the development of the names Melchizedek and Aaronic Priesthood before it was more higher or lesser priesthood. And also the video touches on that there's been a development in priesthood offices. The first presidency doesn't come until after Joseph's ordained to the high priesthood in 1832. And that the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles goes from more of a missionary role to more of an administrative role. Also for this video, I highly recommend this video on Doctrine and Covenants Central. I think they cover this really well, the development in priesthood restoration over time. Uh, I will be borrowing a lot from this video and also a great article I read by historian Michael McKay. So for any non-Latter-day Saint viewers, uh, the priesthood is sort of defined as the power and authority of God given to man to act in God's name to be his representatives and to officiate and perform ordinances such as baptism or certain ordinances we do in the temple. In the church we also have a priesthood structure and hierarchy or leadership and if you want to read more about Aaronic or Melchizedek priesthood or some of the offices or you know keys to the priesthood I would recommend you know this article this page on the church's website I think it'll give quite a good summary, but this is going to be looking more just the development of priesthood. John Dwetnes on the evolution of priesthood has to say, he said, in early Latter-day Saint records, including the Doctrine and Covenants and Book of Commandments, Aaronic or lesser priesthood referred to the office of priest of the Aaronic order, while Melchizedek priesthood or higher priesthood referred to the office of priest of the Melchizedek order. This is especially clear when one looks at earlier versions of the history which indicate that so-and-so was ordained to the high priesthood, which was later changed to read the office of high priest or as a high priest. In Joseph's day, deacon and teachers were not considered to hold the Aaronic priesthood, nor were elders considered to hold the Melchizedek priesthood. Rather, as we read in Doctrine and Covenants 84, the offices of elder and bishop are necessary appendages belong unto the high priesthood, and the offices of teacher and deacon are necessary appendages belonging to the lesser priesthood, which priesthood was confirmed upon Aaron and his sons. As time went by, terms like Melchizedek or higher priesthood and Aaronic or lesser priesthood came to be used as generalized terms to cover other offices as well. In the restored church, the term priesthood in the sense of a generic authority from God came to replace the term holy order used in that sense in the Book of Mormon. The term was also employed in the early years of the restoration, but was gradually replaced by the term priesthood. The history kept by church historian John Whitmer describing the ordination of the first high priest in June 1831, says that Joseph Smith laid his hands upon Lyman White and ordained him to the high priesthood. So in 1835, there was a change or development in sort of like the names for the priesthood. Uh, and in the Book of Mormon, you would see like high priest after the order of the Son of God or after the order of Melchizedek. In Doctrine and Covenants 107, it explains why it's called the Melchizedek Priesthood. Why the first is called the Melchizedek Priesthood is because Melchizedek was such a great high priest. Before his day, it was called the Holy Priesthood after the order of the Son of God. But out of respect or reverence to the name of the Supreme Being, to avoid the too frequent repetition of his name, they, the church, in ancient days, called that priesthood after Melchizedek or the Melchizedek Priesthood. Michael McKay says, historical development, focuses on complex shifts and movements across time that create issues when they are compared to doctrinal concepts. For example, the words Aaronic and Melchizedek and their association with the priesthood only developed in the years after 1829. The terms were defined in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants in the Revelation which became section 107. Terms like Melchizedek were certainly used in the Book of Mormon, the Book of Moses and Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible by 1831, 
yet it is clear that the duality of priesthood developed across time and was not established immediately. The duality of the priesthood was first observed through the development of ecclesiastical offices and the difference between elders and the other offices described in Doctrine and Covenants section 20. Joseph Smith's 1832 history intimates two different priesthood, and then Doctrine and Covenants 84 codified that separation, describing the priesthood as lower and higher. Yet then, the Revelation calls the two priesthood, after Moses and Aaron, instead of Melchizedek and Aaron. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the development in priesthood offices over time. So we have different offices in the church, such as deacon, teacher, priest, bishop, member of the 70, apostle, and these are not the priesthood, but offices or positions in the priesthood. Deacon, teacher, and priest are offices under or within the Aaronic priesthood. Elder, high priest, uh, patriarch, 70 are offices within the Melchizedek priesthood. However, in the early years of the church, there was limited offices of just deacon, teacher, priest, and elder. There was no patriarch, state president, bishop, or apostles, or a high council. The first bishop was called in February 1831, Bishop Edward Partridge. We have high priests being ordained in June 1831 at the conference. The first presidency was formed in March 1832. A high council in February 1834. Church Patriarch, which was Joseph Smith Sr. in December 1834. And then the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the Quorum of the Seventy wasn't formed until February 1835. So all of the priesthood offices and, and callings that we have today in the church, uh, they didn't come straight away when the church was first uh, reorganized. And obviously, I think there's two interpretations uh, that you could draw from this. The faithful one being that this was just Joseph receiving line upon line when it came to the priesthood, priesthood organization and offices, and that there was a development and it wasn't revealed to him all at once, but he had to learn bit by bit. Obviously, the critic would interpret it that if this really was God restoring the priesthood, surely he would have restored it perfectly and accurately whenever the church was first reorganized. And there shouldn't be this development in priesthood offices or in names for the priesthood. And I think you can probably interpret it either way, depending on your position. So let's talk a little bit about how the priesthood was received and restored, particularly the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, this sort of links to what we talked about in the previous video. So we discussed previously how the Aaronic Priesthood was restored May 15th, 1829, when Joseph and Oliver were visited by John the Baptist. The Aaronic Priesthood being mainly the authority to baptize, to administer the sacrament, and holding the keys for the ministering of angels. And after they were given the Aaronic Priesthood, they were commanded to ordain each other and then to baptize each other. Almost like similar to like when an 11 year old receives the Aaronic Priesthood, but then they are then ordained uh, and ordained to the office of deacon. So it appears that Joseph and Oliver, after receiving the Aaronic Priesthood, they ordained each other. Now, the Melchizedek Priesthood we often teach, it was restored by Peter, James and John some point later. In the last video we talked about it was likely between like the 17th to the 31st of May. However, it's not quite as simple as that. Because not only is there the criticism brought up that they refer to Joseph receiving the High Priesthood in 1831 by the hands of Lyman White, but then if you also believe Joseph Smith's other account, where he refers to receiving the Melchizedek priesthood to him and Oliver when they're in the chamber of the Father Whitmer home. He says, We now became anxious to have that promise realized to us, which the angel that conferred upon us the Aaronic priesthood had given us, that provided we continue faithful, we should have also the Melchizedek priesthood, which holds the authority of the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. He then says, We had for some time made this a matter of humble prayer, and at length, we got together in the chamber of Mr. Whitmer's house in order more particularly to seek of the Lord what we now so earnestly desired. And here, to our unspeakable satisfaction, did we realize the truth of the Saviour's promise. Asking you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knocking it shall be opened unto you. For we had not long been engaged in solemn and fervent prayer when the word of the Lord came unto us in the chamber, commanding us that I should ordain Oliver Cowdery to be an elder in the Church of Jesus Christ, and that he also should ordain me to the same office, and then to ordain others. And whenever I read through this, I was like, this is strange. Why are they claiming that the command of the word of the Lord was then to ordain each other to the office of elder? And are they're praying about receiving the Melchizedek priesthood and the authority to give the Holy Ghost, if they'd already received it by Peter, James, and John. 
And this also comes first time from Joseph Smith in his own history, so we can't just dismiss this source. And I'm hoping what I will relate the rest of the video will help to provide more clarity and perhaps challenge maybe some of our assumptions when it's come to the priest or restoration narrative. Historian Michael McKay says in his article, Joseph Smith wrote that diverse angels from Adam down to the present restored the gospel in the last dispensation. The event we usually refer to as the restoration of the priesthood was just the beginning of a long process. As a 2015 article on the church's website summarized, historical documents make clear that the appearance of Peter, James and John near Harmony was only the beginning of the restoration of priesthood authority. Furthermore, the suggestion that priesthood restoration was a process and not a single event should be palatable considering the restoration of keys in 1836 through Moses, Elias and Elijah in the Kirtland Temple and the idea that future keys will yet be restored, such as the keys of the resurrection. So if he received the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood and keys in 1829 by Peter, James and John, then there would be no need for any more reception of priesthood or keys from other heavenly messengers like in the Kirtland Temple or him being ordained to the high priesthood in 1831 by Lyman White. But my my view, my assumption was that the Melchizedek priesthood uh, was in its fullness restored by Peter, James and John in 1829. And actually in Doctrine and Covenants 27 and Doctrine and Covenants 128, it says explicitly what keys were restored by Peter, James and John to Joseph and Oliver. It's the keys to the apostleship, the keys to the kingdom, and the keys of the dispensation of the fullness of times. It doesn't actually say Melchizedek priesthood. Joseph Smith's published history does not narrate the restoration of the greater authority in detail, but it recounts that sometime after his move to Fayette, in the summer of 1829, Joseph and others became anxious to have that promise realized to us, that they would receive the authority of the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Michael McKay goes on to say it was an experience Joseph and Oliver had in the upstairs room of the Peter and Mary Whitmer's house in Fayette Township, New York. In June 1829, so this was after Peter, James and John came and restored those three keys. Joseph and Oliver were finishing the translation of the Book of Mormon and contemplating the visitation of John the Baptist that had happened just a few weeks earlier. After they spent countless hours in the upstairs room, the word of the Lord came to them, directing them to ordain each other elders and to establish the Church of Christ. Joseph recalled that this event was associated with the restoration of the power to give the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Melchizedek Priesthood and the Office of Elder, making it a perfect example to explore how priesthood restoration was a process that included multiple components. This event is not forgotten by history, it's included in Doctrine and Covenants section 128, and described in Joseph Smith's official 1839 history. He goes on to say that very few members of the church discuss this experience of what happened in the Peter Whitmer home. It's not really part of the restoration of the priesthood narrative. There's not been much emphasis on it. And he said this is partly understandable because we don't know a whole lot about it. And when it refers to the word of the Lord, it's uncertain. Does that mean it was revelation to his mind? Was it God audibly speaking? Was there some sort of a physical or spiritual appearance of the Lord? But what's clear is that it's Joseph Smith's most explicit reference to the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood in his history is what happened in the chamber of the Father Whitmer home. So Joseph is saying in his 1839 history, it was in the chamber of the Whitmer home by the command and word of the Lord that they received the Melchizedek priesthood and ordained each other to the office of elder, having the authority to give the gift of the Holy Ghost. The way I interpret this is that he's saying that under Peter, James and John, he received under the Melchizedek priesthood specific keys, such as the keys of the apostleship, keys of the dispensation of the fullness of times, and keys of the kingdom. But then in June 1829, he received the, the Melchizedek priesthood and the authority to ordain each other to the office of elder and bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost. Michael McKay also goes on to say that the reception of the Melchizedek priesthood in the Whitmer home fulfills the promise given to them by John the Baptist. He says that textual connection between the John the Baptist narrative and the chamber of the Father Whitmer, there is this chart that demonstrates that there are three promises made by John the Baptist that are all fulfilled in the chamber of the Father Whitmer. The restoration of the power to give the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Melchizedek priesthood and the office of elder. The experience in the chamber came as a direct result of the dialogue with John the Baptist, not the visit from Peter, James and John. 
And Joseph in his history, as well as in Doctrine and Covenants 128, outlines receiving priesthood and priesthood keys as a process line upon line. He says, A voice of the Lord in the wilderness of Fayette, Seneca County, declaring the three witnesses to bear a record of the book. The voice of Michael on the bank of Susquehanna, detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light. The voice of Peter, James and John in the wilderness between Harmony, Susquehanna and Coolsville, Broome County on the Susquehanna River, declaring themselves as possessing the keys of the kingdom and the dispensation of the fullness of times. And again, the voice of God in the chamber of Old Father Whitmer in Fayette. He then goes on to list other angels, Michael, the archangel, the voice of Gabriel, diverse angels from Michael or Adam down to the present time, all declaring their dispensation, their rights, their keys, their honour, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood giving line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. So he's relating a lot of the visionary experiences and reception of priesthood authority and keys line upon line and this restoration of priesthood authority happening over time. I feel like this is the scripture is Joseph indicating the reception of the priesthood and particularly the Melchizedek priesthood over time as Joseph wants to find that all priesthood is Melchizedek but there are different portions or degrees of it. Michael McKay has to say in summary members are Yet members are well aware that priesthood restoration was a process, not an event, or even just two events. The process of the restoration of the priesthood is described in revelations like Doctrine and Covenants 27, 107, 110, and 128, to be a meeting of heavenly beings on earth with Joseph Smith. Doctrine and Covenants 128, as we read, records Joseph was visited by diverse angels from Michael or Adam down to the present time. The priesthood was not treated or restored as the power of God, but God's power was used authoritatively by this holy order and restored by angels who were ordained members of the priesthood. As such, the priesthood was later described as the restoration of something one could hold as if Melchizedek priesthood was restored in that way and within a single visit or event. As the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles found itself holding the reins of the church, the visit of Peter, James and John was the restoration event that best represented the priesthood restoration and became highlighted as the church developed over time. Brigham Young emphasized the centrality of apostleship above all other restorations, marking the Peter, James and John visit as the central event in the restoration of the priesthood. This suggests that priesthood restoration was a process. Joseph Smith's accounting of Peter, James and John visit, which was clearly part of the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood, was associated with apostleship keys and dispensations. It was not a single event that restored the priesthood, but rather the conferring of an office and administrative authorities that developed over time. Additionally, Joseph's history framed the John the Baptist visit together with the voice of the Lord in the chamber of the Father Whitmer and the establishment of the church to emphasize this part of the process, not to emphasize an event. This bound the restoration of ordinances, offices and priesthood together in his detailed account of priesthood restoration in 1839. Okay, so let's summarize today's episode. So there was a development in priesthood, priesthood offices. In, in the beginning, we had deacon, teacher, priest, an elder, and then later offices of bishop, apostle, high priest, 70, patriarch, and even a high council, and the Quorum of the Twelve came later. The priesthood was referred to as the higher or lower priesthood before being later developed to Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood it being named after the Melchizedek priesthood to avoid the repetition of Jesus Christ's name. The reception of the Melchizedek priesthood wasn't an event, but a process that came line upon line, that it was apostolic keys were received by Peter, James and John, whereas the Melchizedek priesthood and the power to bestow the Holy Ghost and, and the authority to ordain each other to the office of elder came in June 1829 by the voice of the Lord in the Whitmer home. And that there are other angelic visitations bestowing rights, authorities, and keys to the priesthood, such as Elijah and Moses in Kirtland 1836, that Joseph states in section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants, happening over time. And that there is a definite, gradual understanding and restoring of priesthood, priesthood keys, and offices. And certainly the organization within, within the church developed over time. My thoughts as well, like if the critics are adamant, that in 1831, that's when Joseph received the high priesthood for the first time under the hands of Lyman White. And then it's a later invention 
him claiming that he received the high priest or Melchizedek priest in 1835 by Peter, James, and John. And if that then becomes the new narrative, it seems strange to me that in 1839, that Joseph is writing in his history, that he's also receiving the Melchizedek priesthood in the chamber of the Father Whitmer home by the voice of the Lord. It's like there's three different narratives, which if Joseph is just changing the story to Peter, James, and John to make it sound like more miraculous for receiving the Melchizedek priesthood, then it doesn't really make much sense. Then 1839, he's talking about it by like the voice or command of the Lord. So like one one could interpret, as we talked about in the last episode, like the, the critics view that there's vague mentions to priesthood and priesthood authority. Uh, there's high priest after the Lord of Melchizedek in the Book of Mormon. But when the church is first restored, you know, there's just deacon, teacher, priest. They were ordained to the office of elder and, you know, were first apostles, but that the high priesthood wasn't received until 1831 by Lyman White. And then the whole John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John narratives develop after. Even though by 1832 in Joseph's history, he's claiming by the ministry of angels, receiving the holy priesthood. For me, though, what I think is a, a likely interpretation taken into account all of it, and particularly what Joseph is writing towards the end of his prophetic career when it comes to priesthood, is this view of it happening line upon line. So that he received the Aaronic priesthood and they ordained each other in 15th of May, 1829. A couple of weeks later, they received uh, specific keys from Peter, James, and John of the apostleship, keys of the kingdom, keys of the dispensation of the fullness of time. Uh, but the promises that were made by John the Baptist of them awaiting to receive the Melchizedek priesthood to ordain each other to the office of elder and have the authority to give the Holy Ghost was actually fulfilled in the chamber of the Father Whitmer home. But I also see that there is, I think, this limited understanding when it came to offices within the priesthood and recognizing the difference. And then I interpret what happened in 1831, the ordination to the high priesthood is to the office of high priest. I, I really don't think that Joseph believes that that's where he received the high priesthood from. And then additional keys and authority from other heavenly messengers. And again, when it comes to the authenticity of the priesthood restoration, I understand the critics' arguments. I, I've read and researched them, that it's just Joseph and Oliver later inventing the narrative and it's changing and evolving. And I think no doubt the facts are there has been changes and evolution when it comes to development in priesthood offices, names for the priesthood, Joseph's understanding of the priesthood. And you could interpret that as he's later changing things. And yes, there's no explicit mentions to John the Baptist or Peter, James and John in 1829 18, or 1830, it seems like the earliest allusion is 1832 in Joseph Smith's journal and early history, receiving the priesthood by the ministering of angels, and then the clear mentions by 1834, 1835. And it's up to you if you want to interpret it as they're later making it up. For me, taking it all together, I view it as it happened as a process, line upon line. Uh, I don't believe that Oliver was a co-conspirator with Joseph. I feel like as we looked at his testimony and, and his statements and also his actions, uh, I view Joseph, uh, Oliver that he was a sincere believer. And I also think if I take the critic's position as well, that this statement from Joseph about receiving the Melchizedek priesthood in the chamber of the Whitmer home is just kind of a mess then it doesn't make really any sense why he's claiming he received the Melchizedek priesthood there as well if he's just making the whole thing up but those are my thoughts uh check out uh links in the videos in the description definitely the article by Michael McKay and the video on Doctrine and Covenant Central uh, I'm going to be moving on to other topics and videos maybe some specific uh attacks or problems made against some of Joseph Smith's revelations I want to look at some of the prophecies of Joseph Smith uh there's also a few things I want to tie up when it comes to the Book of Mormon Heartland versus Mesoamerica, geography, Yermanthum versus Seer Stone. So there'll be some of that as well. Um, and then probably once I'm done with that in the next couple of months, we'll be moving on to bigger topics uh, like temples and maybe the Book of Abraham. Thanks so much for watching. Take care. Like, share, and subscribe. Receiving. Ugh, pardon. <laughs> receiving thanks everyone for watching this episode if you've enjoyed it please give it a like share it with others who might benefit and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content you can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on anchor spotify and you can follow me on facebook instagram and tiktok check out my website for more content personal blog and more and if you care to donate to support me you can buy my paypal or patreon or through the website and you can also give donations via youtube through super chats thanks for watching mormonism with the murk take care bye bye